Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Energy Frontiers. I am Justina Okechuku, and we say thank you to the African Energy Chamber for supporting this program. It's been a very busy week in the world of energy, headlined by skepticism, confusion, and concerns around OPEC Plus production cutback decisions, as well as the heated debate on fossil fuels at the ongoing UN Climate Summit in the UAE. Now let's get started. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies this week agreed to make additional voluntary cuts to oil production in 2024. However, individual members like Saudi Arabia and Russia have pledged to extend their existing voluntary cuts of 1.3 million barrels a day until the end of the first quarter of 2024. In Africa, Algeria will implement an additional cut of 51,000 barrels per day from next January to March. But on the flip side, Angola rejected OPEC's quota and reaffirmed its proposal for 1.18 million barrels of crude oil for the next year 2024, while Nigeria and Congo are yet to make an announcement. In my interview chat with Abi Rajendran, head of global oil and downstream markets at Energy Intelligence, Abi tells me where he thinks the metrics of demand, supply and price will be heading in 2024 following OPEC Plus latest decisions. Now, um, it's been a long week of expectations. So give me your first word on the outcome of the OPEC meeting. What is in line? Uh, was it in line with your expectations? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there were growing expectations going into the meeting that there would be an additional cut announced. Um, you know, of course, there was all this, you know, noise that came up about the baselines and some of the issues, as you brought up, from certain countries like Angola and Nigeria. Um, so that was, you know, that, that was part of it. But, the, you know, but even with that, there was this growing expectation of um, additional cuts to be announced. Now, I think... You know, most folks expected that the, you know, the voluntary additional cuts that Saudi Arabia and Russia have been doing right for the last several months would also be rolled over to the first quarter. I think that was basically a base case expectation. Uh, and, and so the question was going to be, you know, what else, right? You know, what was going to come on top of it? Now, you know, depending on the math, depending on what you count and don't count, you know, OPEC Plus did announce an incremental, you know, 700 to 900,000 barrels a day of additional cuts, depending on whether you want to count, you know, Russian fuel oil or not. Uh, and, you know, but, but there are, you know, addition, there are kind of lingering questions, right, as you brought up, which we can talk about. There are lingering questions, uh, you know, coming out of the meeting, uh, for sure. But, you know, look, on, on, on paper, they did announce, you know, a fairly, uh, you know, substantial additional cut, uh, you know, for the first quarter, at least. Now, how significant are these baseline figures and what are you hearing from individual countries in Africa regarding um, their cutbacks? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, I think the baseline issue is in part a separate issue, but in part also, you know, related to, uh, you know, to the cuts themselves, right? Because I think that that kind of plays into the math of how much is actually going to be cut in the first quarter and which is also partly why I think the market is a little bit, a little bit skeptical, right? So, so I think, you know, for the most part, I would say the baselines themselves are not a very material issue in terms of, you know, from a supply standpoint, uh, coming from OPEC plus, um, you know, I think, you know, even coming out of the meeting, there's still kind of this lingering question with Angola in particular, right? Which, you know, kind of pushed back and said, we just don't agree with the quota uh, and we're planning to produce more. So that's, you know, that's going to have to be sorted out. But again, you know, we're talking about maybe some 50, 70,000 barrels a day. It, it, in, you know, in the scheme of things, it's not going to matter uh, a whole lot. So the baselines themselves, I don't think are a whole, you know, are, are a major issue. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, the market reaction and the focus is going to be really more, as you pointed out earlier, on the compliance um, and how much actual, like, you know, new volume is going to be taken off the market, you know, versus what would have been previously expected in the first quarter. I think there's some questions around, for example, Russia, right? You know, Russia, you know, fuel oil is always higher in the winter, um, you know, as, as the winter ends, 
you know, that, that kind of comes down anyway. So is that really an additional 200,000 barrel a day cut? I don't think so. So I look at kind of more the 700,000 barrel a day number. Um, and then there's also questions around, you know, around, you know, for example, the UAE. The UAE actually, actually has a higher baseline that was previously agreed to from January, right? So net net is that, you know, a substantial cut or a cut at all coming from the UAE, uh, you know, compared to current volumes, right? It, it probably isn't much. So, so I think there are some of these, you know, lingering issues and questions to be sorted out. Um, that's in part why I think the market response is, you know, kind of a, a shoulder shrug for now. Um, and we'll just kind of have to wait and see, right? We're, we just hit December one. It's crazy that it's already December. Um, we'll just kind of have to wait and see over the next one or two months as we get more information. World leaders, business executives, and activists converge at the UN Climate Summit in Dubai to discuss actionable steps to curb climate change. More on this in a moment. Welcome back. Now, delegates from more than 200 countries are meeting for nearly two weeks in the United Arab Emirates for the United Nations Conference on Climate Change, or COP28. These leaders across politics, policies, and businesses are gathered to lend the voice to urgent solutions and actions needed to mitigate and adapt to climate change. On day one of the summit, History was made after COP28 President Dr. Sultan al Jaba gathered the first major milestone of COP28, delivering an agreement to operationalize this loss and damage fund, which will assist developing countries that are vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. Let's listen. The science has spoken. It has been loud and clear. It has confirmed that the moment is now to find a new road. Through the global stocktake, we have a chance to unite the three core elements of the climate agenda. We can finally bring mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation, which includes finance, under one umbrella. For my part, I pledge that I will run an inclusive and transparent process, one that encourages free and open discussion between all parties. That means it is essential that no issue is left off the table. And yes, as I have been saying, we must look for ways and ensure the inclusion of the role of fossil fuels. We all know that a key success factor across climate agenda is finance. This presidency is committed to unlocking finance to ensure that the global south does not have to choose between development and climate action and let history reflect the fact that this is the presidency that made a bold choice to proactively engage with oil and gas companies. In the meantime, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres drew the battle line on fossil fuels, calling for a total phase out of dirty energy in every form around the world. Excellencies, Earth's vital signs are failing. Record emissions, ferocious fires, deadly droughts, and the hottest year ever. We can guarantee it even we are still in November. We are miles from the goals of the Paris Agreement and minutes to midnight for the 1.5 degree limit. But it is not too late. But climate action can flip the switch 
And renewable energy is the gift that keeps on giving. The diagnosis is clear. The success of the COP depends on the global stock take prescribing a credible cure in three areas. First, drastically cutting emissions. The G20, which represents 80% of the world's emissions, must lead. And I urge countries to speed up their net zero timelines to get there as close as possible to 2040 in developed countries and 2050 in emerging economies. Second, we cannot save a burning planet via fire holes of fossil fuels. We must accelerate a just, equitable transition to renewables. The science is clear. The 1.5 degree limit is only possible if we ultimately stop burning all fossil fuels. Not reduce, not abate, phase out with a clear time frame aligned with 1.5 degrees. It must also commit to triple renewables, double energy efficiency, and bring clean energy to all by 2030. However, the Secretary General of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, Haytham Algaes, has said that energy transitions need more involvement and an unprecedented investment in all forms of energy, including oil and gas. It's no longer business as usual as climate conversations continue at the COP28 summit. Stay with us on Energy Frontiers. This is Energy Frontiers. The Climate Summit in Dubai headed into the weekend with the COP28 President, Dr. Sultan al Jaba, announcing the UAE Declaration of Leaders on Global Climate Finance Framework and setting out a roadmap for the future of climate finance. 11 countries, including the Republic of Ghana, Kenya, Senegal, and Barbados, were pivotal in the success of that landmark framework. Let's hear now from that panel of heads of state. For a very long time, Africa has been in the corner of problems. We're trying to move Africa from being in the corner of problems to the corner of solutions. And we stated very clearly that we have ideas, we have suggestions, we believe Africa has the greatest stake in contributing to the solution around climate change. And that is why we believe that we are very well positioned to be part of the solution to the challenge we have today. So that as Macron says, no country is left between making a choice between development or climate action. So we have real assets that we can bring to the table to solve the problem of climate change and to solve the problem of development. So, Africa has the potential. We have the opportunity. We have every, everything that we need to power our green industrialization. And that is the reason why we are very clear about what is lacking. That is climate finance. And that is why we are willing to go all the way to the launch we are going to make uh, in this, uh, in this, in this scope of a new framework, what we called in Nairobi, a new uh, global financing charter. We're talking, and Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke about it when he spoke, and we're talking about trillions of, 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 of monies that are required for the transition to be effective in the vulnerable nations of the world. It is now clear to all of us that that money cannot come from taxpayers' monies in the West. It can't come from pu pu uh, public monies. It has to come from the private sector where the trillions of monies available in the globe are. And I think that that points to one immediate 
solution for us? To what extent institutions like your own, the IMF and the World Bank can become bridges for countries like my own and the vulnerable countries to be able to access that, that, uh, these funds. Historically, the monies that we, are, we have access to have been the most expensive monies in, in the world. We are the poorest people on the globe, and when we borrow money, we pay more for it than those who have money. That is a, a situation that has, and it can only be reversed if the World Bank and the IMF become this catalyst for being able to access the large monies that are out there. And I think that that, for us, from what we have seen in Ghana, is something extremely important. We've lived so far on the assumption that some people have to be poor for others to be rich. That mindset is what is at stake in the whole climate discussion. Because for it to succeed, for us to be able to make the transition that will enable all of us to live on in this planet in an equitable and successful manner, we all have to see ourselves as part of one family. That has not been the picture up till now. Are people now prepared to recognize that we can create a world where there'll be prosperity will be even and broadly based? Um, we believe, for example, that the capitalization of the loss and damage fund is critical because it provides essential grant funds post-disaster and that is absolutely necessary. But the scale of its capitalization will be a concern to all if it is not properly capitalized. We've been talking about public money, which has to continue. We've been talking, however, also about mechanisms for non-state actors contributing. And whether it is through the international taxation that Emmanuel is speaking about, um, where we can spread the burden not just to the oil and gas companies, which we've said, if you've made four trillion in profits last year, 200 billion will not hurt you. Treat 95% of your profits as 100% and give the other 5% to be shared between a loss and damage fund and finance and resilience and adaptation through the mechanisms. We need to be able to determine how best we're going to manage and regulate carbon markets. We're talking all over the place and we haven't settled on how best this can work to avoid the greenwashing and to avoid implosion. Meanwhile, the African Development Bank Group, together with the Global Center on Adaptation, the African Union Commission, and the governments of Kenya and Senegal, jointly hosted an Adaptation Finance Summit for Africa at the COP28 Summit. The Sideline Summit aims to secure renewed commitments foster collaboration among African finance and economic ministers, as well as strengthening the integration of climate resilience into Africa's development agenda. The latest Climate Vulnerability Index shows that nine out of 10 most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa is simply choking from climate change. It loses seven to $15 billion annually due to climate change, and that is projected to rise to $50 billion by 2050. However, Africa receives just 4.5% of the global climate finance. And access to financing for adaptation is even more challenging, with the continent receiving $11 billion for climate adaptation, when in fact its needs are 10 times more. The African Development Bank is responding strongly to climate adaptation needs of Africa. We now devote 63% of our total climate finance to adaptation, the highest share among all multilateral development banks globally. We plan to mobilize up to $14 billion for climate action window to support climate adaptation for Africa across 37 low-income countries. I am very pleased, therefore, to announce here today that the operationalization of the Climate Action Window starts right here and right now at this COP. As we are gathering here in Dubai, the message from Africa 
and other developing countries clear. We need urgent adaptation action and support. Uh, there is uh, a message somewhere I saw. They say action bids hope. So let us create hope for the developing countries. With unfulfilled climate finance pledges and that we are facing greater climatic related disasters, it may not be visible in the future to solely rely on public financing. I've been reliably informed that during this COP28, the Global Center for Adaptation will formalize partnership under the AAAP to provide technical support for 700 million in private finance through green bonds issued by two Tanzanian commercial banks. And that's the package of Energy Frontiers at this time. And we thank you all for watching. Be sure to follow the program on Frontier Africa Reports website, like this video, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us across all our social media handles as indicated on the screen. I am Justina Okechuku. I'll see you next time.